This is a heavy moment for me because um, these are, in a way, you know, this is this message is being used to launch our our prayer study we're getting to go into. But knowing this was going to be my last sermon to this body, I also wanted to really consider my words carefully. Um, and so I know sometimes I can be a little long-winded. <laughs> Those of you who've heard me preach before, you know that. But um, just for this next moment, please listen to my words carefully. Because I really believe there's something that the Lord has for us today. So if you have your Bibles, please go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. And as you're going there, uh, as I was wrestling with what to preach for this message, there was a question that kept coming to my mind that was perplexing me. And it was something that I saw in Scripture where it seemed like Jesus was contradicting himself. And as I looked into these two things that he said that seemed contradictory, I started to see something that he was wanting to show me about his heart. I actually came across this several months ago, and I've just been going over it again and again in my mind. And as, as I wrestled with this apparent contradiction, God showed me something so special about his heart, not only for me, but what he wants for his church. And you might be asking, what's this contradiction? Is, 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 can God contradict himself? In Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 14, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, but those who find it are few. But as we're going to see in our main text for today, in Matthew 11, Jesus says at the end of it, 28 through 30 specifically, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take, your yoke upon, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So there seems to me, at least, to be a contradiction here. On one hand, we have Jesus saying, the way is narrow and it is hard that leads to life. But then he's also saying, take my yoke upon you, learn from me. He's saying his burden is easy and it's light. So which is it, Jesus? Is your way hard or is it easy? And the reason I was wrestling with this is because a question I was asking myself in my mind, as I have a common theme, if you've heard you know, my last several messages when I've gotten to preach here, something that I am constantly talking about is claiming our identity in Christ. And that he has so much freedom and purpose that is readily available to us that so few of us access and I know most of you sitting in here, okay, we're in here, we sing about the joy and the greatness of God, but I know most of us, and I've been at this point many times in my life, where we struggle because we know, okay, I see all this in the Word, all this freedom that He talks about, this, this joy, this contentment, but I know I am still missing something. I prayed the prayer, I went to the altar, I've asked God this the same thing over and over again. Why am I still missing this? Is Jesus confused? Did he know what he was saying when he said the way is narrow and hard, but also saying my yoke is easy and my burden is light? If this, is, this freedom is so available for us, why is it so hard to obtain? And it's that question that really sent me into this wrestling match with the Lord for the past couple months. And 
and I'm thankful that me and him did wrestle together because I have found in my own life when God seems to contradict himself or say something strange or something that doesn't make sense or I come across something in his word that offends me, it's usually something he's wanting to reveal to me about himself because it is in those moments of wrestling when we, have the, when we see the contradictions or we have the questions, there's something he wants to say in there. Because it's when we have those questions and we wrestle with the doubts, that's an invitation to enter into a conversation with him. And if you've been a student of Scripture for some time, you will see that Jesus says things in really weird ways. And the thing I think find ironic about a lot of churches today is that we, we act like, oh, now that we're here 2,000 years later, we get it now. Jesus' silly disciples and his followers, they didn't understand anything. If it was so easy, why do we have 3,000 denominations? Why do we see more Christians fighting each other than being united in our purpose for spreading the gospel together? What we're going to see today is maybe a lot of us in our personal relationship with Jesus, maybe Jesus isn't completely who we think he is. Because a lot of us, we have baggage, we have wounds, we have trauma that is filtering what a correct perception of God should be. And so our temptation is, especially in today's culture with our, you know, 144 word sound and character bites with Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever. We think we can sum up um, a scripture or something God said and it justifies our opinion, whether we're on the right or the left. I don't care what side of the aisle we're on. Okay, we, 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 we try to boil everything into these bite-sized pieces of information. We think, that's it, I got it figured out. When there's a lot more that the Lord wants to talk to us about. So I believe here in this text there is something very deep and precious to the Lord that he wants to show us about his heart. Because just to give you a preview, God's heart oftentimes is a mystery. His ways are strange if you've been following him for a while. And this is one of the several instances where he actually describes his heart. And he says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. Yet, the way is narrow and the way is hard. So, This is our main text. I'm going to go ahead and read it. We're going to come back to it because we're going to have to go back to get some context to see what Jesus is talking about here. So reading the whole thing now, Matthew eleven twenty-five 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light." So if we want to know what Jesus is saying here in this riddle, we're going to have to go back to the context. And, we're, when I'm, and you don't have to flip here because I'm going to be jumping all over the place, but I'm just going to go back to the beginning of Matthew chapter 11. And to get to the key of the riddle here, there's going to be three parts. Three parts to, to, to unlock what Jesus is trying to say here about his heart. So this first part... I mentioned earlier, Jesus isn't who you think he is. Matthew 1 through 6, I'm just starting with the first three verses. 
So when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? So just so you know which John this passage is talking about, it's talking about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist's background is he was a miracle birth. He was given to Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were an old age. And miraculously, an, an angel appears to Zechariah. And you, you know the story. He, he says, you're going to have a, a child in old age. And there was going to be something special about this child. John was what the Old Testament prophets spoke about the next Elijah, the one who would go ahead preparing the way for the Lord, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. And as John grew older, he was very aware of his calling and his purpose. He himself says in Matthew 2, 2 through 3, when he's spreading his message, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John knew who he was. John knew what he was about. He knew his mission. He knew that he was the person that Isaiah was talking about. He knew the Messiah was going to show up any second. What a massive calling. The world and the people of God had been waiting for thousands of years for this Messiah. And John is chosen as the one who is going to announce his arrival. And so when Jesus shows up on, this, on the scenes, John says, Behold, the Messiah. You can only imagine the excitement that he must have felt. This is it. Because at the time, they were living under the oppression of the Roman government. They were dealing with an incredibly corrupt religious system that the Pharisees had forced on the people. And John, like Jesus, called out their fakeness over and over again. Because of that, they didn't like him, just like they didn't like Jesus. And so John had to be thinking in his head, this is it. This is the moment God has come. His kingdom is here. Everything is going to be set right, and his kingdom and his righteousness are going to be established. But even John, as great as he was, he had to wrestle himself with the question of, is Jesus who I think he is? Because as you, you eventually see with his other disciples, particularly Peter, there was this confusion when Jesus went to the cross and suffered and was tortured. And the, other, and the disciples later on in the end of the Gospels, you see, they're, they're like, this is, this is not how it was supposed to be. Jesus was supposed to set up his kingdom. He was supposed to win. We lost. And praise God, Easter is coming up because we know he didn't lose. But I'll save that message for Pastor Phil when, he, uh, when Easter comes up. But right now, John, we find that in Matthew 14, we find out that John the Baptist was arrested. He's sitting in prison because King Herod had him arrested basically for calling him out for marrying his brother's wife, committing incest basically. And so Herod's wife didn't like John calling him out. And John has a tragic ending to his story. We're all at the request of a silly dancing girl. John is beheaded. The forerunner to the Messiah. And that's how it ends. So sitting in that prison, John had to have been wrestling and struggling, and it hit a rock-bottom moment, asking his, his followers to go ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? He must have been struggling with his identity, because you know he had to be thinking, did I miss it? 
I've been in, I grew up in the wilderness. I gave up everything for the Lord. He took the vow of the Nazarite. He didn't drink. He let his hair grow out. We know how scripture just, like, he dressed weird. He was dressed in camel skin and ate locusts and honey. Like he gave up everything for his calling. And he had to be wondering, did I mess something up? Was it supposed to end this way? John was facing a rock bottom moment in his life. And what we can gather from that for every single person in this room, it is not a matter of if we will hit rock bottom at some point. It is a matter of when. Every single person in here is going to face rock bottom. There is going to come a moment in your life, even if you have family or friends, you are going to face a situation where nobody is going to understand what you are going through. It is just going to be you and the Lord. Nobody else. And for John, this was probably one of those moments. And for us, each of us are going to have those moments. We're going to face maybe a dream that fails. Maybe a marriage doesn't work out. Maybe a relationship doesn't turn out how we expected it to. Maybe you lose a job. Whatever it may be, A, B, or C, fill in the blank. You know what you're dealing with or have dealt with. And we're in that moment, and it's just us and the Lord. Nobody else. And it's in that moment, and plenty of other pastors have said this, I'm not the first to say it, but these are called the, the dark nights of the soul when we hit rock bottom. And in my own life, I remember specifically a moment where I was on my bedroom floor in tears asking the Lord, do you see me? Do you hear me? I've followed you all these years. But strangely in that moment when I was asking the Lord that, it's like this hushness came over me that I can't explain. And this question came to my mind. Am I still worth following even if you get nothing out of it? Because I did. I had all these questions for him. Why, Lord? Why? A lot, like a lot of us ask, we're human. There's nothing wrong about asking those things, okay? So I'm not here to shame anybody that has questions. And I found in my life that sometimes he does answer those questions. He does show the puzzle piece. Hey, this is why this, this, this and happened, and now you're here. Praise God for those moments when we can see that. But in my own life, and as with many others that I've had to to, 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 to talk with through really hard times, he seldom answers those questions because there's something deeper he wants to get at in our heart. There is something more that we need than the answer to our questions. For me, it was, am I still worth following even if you get nothing out of it? Now, I've been able to answer that question for myself, but everybody in here, at some point, you're going to have to ask that for yourself. Is he still worth following, even if you get nothing out of it? And that's why, too, I try to be so careful. When I talk to people about tithing or reading the word or praying, I try to be very careful of saying anything that has to do with, well, if you do A, B, or C, God's going to do A, B, or C in your life. Now, there's definitely blessing that comes with obedience. I'm not, I'm not saying that, um, you know, that we shouldn't be obedient because you're not going to get anything out of it. My point is this. If you have read Scripture, particularly Job or Ecclesiastes, or if you see how the disciples' lives ended, most of them were killed. Eleven out of the twelve. John was the only one that survived. That's what they got for their faithfulness. But they still saw something enough in God to know he is worth giving everything for. 
But again, that is a question that I cannot answer for you. It is something you have to answer for yourself. And the bottom line of that is he good. So Jesus responds to him. In verse 4, Jesus answered and says, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended with me. When I first read this, I, my first thought again was, here he goes again, he's speaking in riddles, he's being confusing. I read that and I was like, because I'm feeling John's pain in this passage because I feel like I've been here. I was like, Jesus, why can't you just be straight with him? He's an example in Scripture of probably more than anybody else that's, that's, that's an example of faithfulness to you. Out of anybody, he deserves to have his questions answered. And Jesus gives him this strange answer like he usually does. But then I wanted to know why did, so I did some research. Why did, what was Jesus saying here? And Jesus right here is actually quoting from the book of Isaiah. And then this switch went off and I realized Jesus is not condemning John here. But I've heard teachers use this passage to basically condemn John's doubt. Jesus is actually doing something beautiful here and speaking in a way specifically that was unique for John. Going back to what I said earlier when John quoted Isaiah 43, John knew he was the prophesied one to be the voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. Because of that, and Isaiah, because he knew who he was and he knew his mission was to announce the Messiah, he would have spent most of his time studying the prophet Isaiah. He would have probably combed Isaiah backwards and forwards, knowing every single detail, every single scripture that talked about the Messiah, because he was going to prepare, he knew his calling and he was going to be prepared for it. Jesus here is specifically quoting Isaiah 29, 18 through 19, Isaiah 35, and Isaiah 61. Prophecies about himself, because Jesus knew who he was too. He knew what he was about. And he, again, going back to this, says, Go and tell John, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. So in other words, John, you didn't miss it. I am the Messiah that Isaiah spoke of. Don't miss what I'm saying here. Jesus spoke uniquely to John in a way that John would have gotten. Rather than just Jesus just giving him a simple band-aid answer, yes, I'm the Messiah. He used John's calling in his heart because the book of Isaiah would have been very near and dear to the heart of John. And to me, I started thinking about that with my own relationship with Jesus. And some of you guys who have been in a, our, our leadership training courses, you heard, you've heard me talk about when we start practicing to hear from the Lord, you have to know your lingo. And what I mean by that is, okay... Some of you in here, you're visual learners. Some of us, we, we learn things through words or songs. Some of us are kinesthetic. We, we got to put our hands on things and build things. Okay, for me, you guys have heard me joke before about how, I mean, I just, I love different movies and shows, partly because I'm always trying to pick out philosophy and worldview and stuff. But particularly for some reason, I, just because of how I'm wired, God speaks to me so much and movies. That's why, like, sometimes you probably don't want to go to a movie with me because I will cry at the most random parts that make no sense. I'll give you an example. Recently, um, if you're a 90s kid in here, you may remember the Goofy movie, okay? I was watching that recently, 
And, you know, it's, it's you know, yuck, goofy from Disney, that one, just to make sure I'm clear. All right. There's this scene where Goofy and his son, Max, they're getting in the classic, you know, father-dad argument where Max is like, I'm not a kid anymore. You got to trust me. And, and you know, and, 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 and Goofy's struggling with being a father, letting his son grow up. But they get in this argument, and they get in a car wreck, and the car ends up in the river, and then they're floating down this river on the hood of the car. And so, you know, after they make up and they get along and stuff, Max starts freaking out because there's this waterfall ahead, and it's supposed to be this comedic moment in the middle of the movie. And, and, and Max is freaking out, and he keeps trying to get his dad's attention. He's like, Dad, 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 Dad. And then, and after they just had this talk, you know, Goofy gets frustrated again. He's like, now, son, why do you always think I'm going to lead you towards some kind of calamity? Guys, in that moment, I started bawling my eyes out. Because I just can't explain it. It's like God's presence was with me right there on my couch, like he was sitting next to me asking me, son, why do you always think I'm going to lead you towards disaster? Because something I was struggling with in the moment there was, he's not going to provide for me. He's always holding a carrot. He's going to yank the rug out from under my, even though I wouldn't have said it that way. But because God understands that's my language, okay, and it's not that he's saying something that's contradictory to or outside of his word. That's Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the, the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. I'm not going to lead you towards a calamity. We're going to go through hard stuff, but God promises there's purpose in all of it. Okay? There's plenty of other examples. My my anime crowd over here, you know we could talk about anime all day, but most of the people in here wouldn't understand this, so if we can stay cool, they can stay uncool. All right? So, (laughs) but, um, but anyway, the point is, Know how you're wired because so many times, okay, knowing how you're wired, that's going to give you a clue to how God is trying to get your attention. There's a reason you're drawn to certain books and literature and songs and movies, okay? Pay attention to those things. So just like with John, God is speaking to John in a way he understands. Just like with your kids, You don't discipline them all the same way. You don't give them advice in all the same way um, because they speak different languages. My brothers, okay, for example, um, you know, Drew's love language is acts of service. Caleb's is quality time. Daniel is having really deep conversations at really inconvenient hours in the night. (laughs) So... But that's okay because that is how God made them. And me, I'm words of affirmation. We've heard the the love languages thing before, okay? So if I try to show them my care for them with words of affirmation, it's not going to stick as much. But if I do something for Drew or if I spend time with Caleb, Caleb won't ever straight up tell me, hey, I really miss you. But he'll call me and be like, hey, you want to hang out? It's no big deal. Just But in other words, it's like, hey, I love you, bro, and I want to spend time with you. I know you won't say it, Caleb, but I love you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He's, he tells me he loves me. But the point is, know your lingo, know how you're wired, and God, God can say something through you in there. So getting back to Jesus' response to what, John's, uh, to what John was asking, Jesus also says something else that's strange. He says, and blessed is the one who has not offended me. So first he comforts John and he affirms his identity and his calling. And he reminds him, you didn't miss it. I'm exactly who Isaiah said I am. And you are who Isaiah said you are. Your ministry was not in vain. The dream was not in vain. But he finishes with this strange line, and blessed is the is the one who is not offended by me. So going back, John must have understandably been perplexed, shocked, and surprised that things were turning out the way that they did. I can only imagine all the questions that he had in his mind. But in the rock-bottom moment, 
Here's what happens when we face those moments. There is a shattering that takes place because, because the very fact that we are asking the question and saying, is this how it was supposed to be? Or saying, it wasn't supposed to turn out this way. It shows us that any sort of faulty thinking or preconceived idea that we had about how a certain situation should work out or how God should respond to my prayer, we find out that maybe that assumption that, or perception we were having before, maybe it wasn't grounded in truth. And again, not to say that John necessarily missed the truth, but sometimes we might miss the timing or the way that God wants to do something. We expect Him to answer our prayer in a certain way. And so when He doesn't do that, there's an opportunity to have an offense towards God here. So let me clarify again, there is nothing absolute, there's absolutely nothing wrong with struggling with doubt and asking God questions. Those are the moments in your life that He wants to do deep work in you. But this is also a crossroads. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So when I was faced with that question, is Jesus worth following even if I get nothing out of it? I was faced again with this other question of, well, if I get nothing out of it, where else am I going to have to go? Because it, I've had these moments of anger where I thought, well, wow, I can show him. like, I can take care of myself since I feel like I haven't been taken care of. But I can guarantee you, I have, I have talked with enough people from different walks of life and have spent my time with my head buried in so many different philosophy books searching for different answers. I can tell you, every other road leads to a dead end. There's a difference between pain that we suffer because we follow Jesus because that's pain with purpose. And there's a difference between that and needless suffering because we're following a dead end. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. And so like Peter, I came to that moment where with Jesus, I was like, Lord, when Peter was asked, who do you say I am? He says, you're the Messiah. And Jesus is like, why haven't you gone in the other direction? Just Peter's, where else do we have to go? Who else has the words of eternal life? Who else is going to comfort you when you're in pain? Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Here's the problem with chasing the answers to your questions. If you think getting the answer to all your questions is going to make you happy, guess what? Life never lets up. There will be moments of joy and happiness. I'm not saying life is all dark. Praise God for those seasons of rest and, and joy. But for every question you have answered, there is going to be another one that is going to take its place. For every challenge you overcome, there is going to be another challenge that overtakes its place. For every suffering you encounter, there is another suffering that will happen eventually down the road. That is the reality of living in a fallen world. So if you think you are going to have all your questions answered and that's what you need, you will be chasing answers to your questions for the rest of of your life. And like James talks about, we'll be cast to and fro like a person who doubts. And I, I know I just said doubting's okay. I'm talking about this is a different kind of doubt. You know, it's 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 never taking God at his word. Okay. But you're never gonna get the answer to all those questions and you're not gonna find healing in the answer to your questions either. 
Healing is found in the person of Jesus alone. I wish I could, I wish the word said what John's reaction was to what Jesus said. We can see enough here to see that Jesus spoke directly to the heart of John in this passage. So when we're at this crossroads, we can either take God at his word and who he says he is, and we decide, yes, he is worth it, even if I get nothing out of it. Or we fall into this other category that Jesus is about to talk about. So this is the second part of the key. Jesus knows the heart. So the first part of the key we talked about earlier, Jesus isn't who we think he is. Second, Jesus knows the heart. This is Matthew eleven seven 7 through 19. I won't read all of this, but just to get an idea of what Jesus is getting at. And the crowd is there listening to Jesus. And they, as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before you, your face, who will prepare your way before you. And he goes on in the next several verses, and he, he commends John, and he says, there's been no one greater than John the Baptist, except he who is least in the kingdom of heaven will even be greater than him. But just continuing on, Jesus goes into verse 16, and he says, But what, to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he is a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. So in other words, I can, only, I can imagine Jesus' tone here almost being angry and frustrated because first the people saw the power and the authority that John preached with, and believe it or not, even Herod, even though he killed John, he liked listening to John's preaching. He had a very corrupt person who loved convicting preaching, but his heart was never changed about it by it. Jesus, who had been traveling and performing all these signs and miracles, and the question Jesus is basically asking is, it's that, that moment where Maximus and Gladiator is standing before the crowd. He says, are you not entertained? Because Jesus is revealing the hearts and the intentions of most people where the reason I truly believe God speaks in riddles sometimes is because it shows who is really hungry for the truth and who is not. Because they're condemning both John and Jesus here. They're contradicting themselves. Again, John came neither eating nor drinking. They say John's crazy. Yet Jesus, he, he, Jesus ate and drank and spent time with tax collectors and sinners. And yet, you know, they say, look at Jesus. He's a glutton and a drunkard. So which is it? The point is, Jesus is pointing out their contradictory natures in their hearts to show you're not concerned about truth. You're concerned about protecting your status and your way of living. And that's why you're constantly changing the rules and putting unnecessary burdens on my people. Because it's about you, not about the truth. So we have to ask ourselves, when we come to that moment, will we be offended by the Lord? Will we be like that? Do we really want the truth? And then moving into the final part, of the key right here, back to the passage we started with. So Jesus gives the key to his heart, Matthew eleven twenty-five 25 through 30. So before this, Jesus announces, he, he had just finished announcing woes on different cities, saying, woe is you, this place and that place. I'm not going to read all the names, but basically because he performed all these signs and they still didn't believe. But Jesus says, again, he says, I thank you, Father and Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to 
reveal him. And as the children's pastor here, closing out on this in my last sermon here, is special to me because I've told you guys how much these kids have taught me. You know, I came here hoping, gosh, I want to make a difference in these kids' lives, but the Lord used them to radically change me. Because as somebody who was driven to perform and do all these things and prove myself that everybody had me wrong, okay, kids are not interested in what you've accomplished. They don't care that I have a master's degree or that I'm learning a new language and that I've done these things. You go up and tell, you tell a kid like your accomplishments and what you tried to do, this is their response. Well, that's cool. In Minecraft today, I built a new fort and discovered a new diamond. Check out my Disney princess bag. They just want to be with you. They don't care about any of that. And they're always open to adventure. And, 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 and they're, they're trusting and they know that they're going to be provided for. Stuff that the world, when we get older and become adults, we, we get hurt, we get lied to, we betrayed. So we, we put up walls up, we put walls up, we close ourselves off. And we, we lose that childlike sense of adventure and wonder that we were always meant to take with us. Again, I, more than any theologian or pastor or commentary or Bible study series, those kids have taught me more about the heart of God than anybody else. Caleb, not to pick on you again. I know I picked on you last week. But did you know that because of you, Every time I look at the moon that I'm reminded of the Lord's presence with me. Because we, we were doing a, a, a camp. We were talking about apologetics. And I was using a lot of stuff about space because I'm a space geek. And, you know, Caleb said something along the lines of, you know, the moon really reminds me of the Lord because it's always shining and it's always there. He's always with you. And Caleb, do you know how many moments I've had in my life after you said that? Where I was, you know, on a walk or praying or struggling with something and I looked up at the moon and because of what you said, I was, you know, I was able to smile because I'm like, he's with me. So thank you for that. Sydney, we talked a lot before, but thank you. Oh, you kids, you've, you've changed my life. Thank you. So, you know, children's ministry it tends to get put on the back burner a lot of places. We think kids, they don't have much to offer. Gosh, God has so much to give us through them. But those of us who are prideful, pride is completely opposite to the heart of God. And those of us who think, we have it all figured out, and we're not willing to ask those tough questions. When our heart is in that state, we are not going to see the Lord. Instead, a lot of churches, we get obsessed with forming our cliques, our programs. We talk more about production quality than getting people into the presence of God. And we talk about our, our signs of God move sometimes. You hear a lot of like bigger churches and stuff talk about Oh man, the tie's up. More people are here. What about celebrating addictions being broken, marriages being put back together, and people that were broken being made whole again? That's what we're here for. Not programs and events. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with those, but when those things are the focus. There's so many churches I look at, and it's exactly like what the Pharisees were doing. Jesus is not interested in any of that. He doesn't care about your accomplishments, your financial plan, your house or your two cars in the driveway or all these false status symbols that our, our society puts on us. He wants your audience, your presence. Pride keeps us so much that the Lord has to offer for us. Guys, I, I'm moving into my closing. If you, I know I've been going a while. I just want to say, just, just bear with me just a little bit. This is my last time with you. I really want to pour some things into you before I leave. Okay? 
But just like last, um, the other night, if, if some of y'all saw my Facebook story, I had a little bit of fun the other night <laughs> from 3 to 5 in the morning in the snow. But when I saw that it was snowing outside, the adult side of me was like, I really should be in bed right now. It's cold outside, and I'm going to get wet, and it's 3 a.m. I don't need to be walking around downtown Cleveland at 3 in the morning. But then I just heard, go have fun. Forget about it. <laughs> so I ran outside, and I'm so glad I did. Okay, I made a dance video. I built a snowman. I slid around in the snow, slid on my belly. Okay. And I had my deep moments, too, because I've got this fun, crazy side, but also this deep side, and I was walking, like, munching on a snowball, just having my deep thoughts. But then again, the Lord was reminding me, just like, just stop. I had this moment, too, where I, like, lifted my hands because it was snowing, and I was like, Lord, be with me now. And I just heard in my spirit, like, just stop. Just have fun, okay, because we try to make everything so serious. It was like God was, and for me, that was important because I've told you guys, I'm nervous stepping into this next chapter because God has just told me, just leave. I'm not going to show you what's next. This thing that I'm putting together in your heart, I'm not going to show you what it's called, who's going to be part of it and all this stuff and, and all the details that you want up front. So there's, there's a little bit of fear with that, but thank God for f weird friends in your life. I have this friend, okay, and uh, he has a way of saying really profound things in the weirdest ways. And I was talking to him about this. I asked if I could quote him this morning. He said, Matthew, when God closes a door, sometimes it's fun to jump out the window. <laughs> and I cracked up at that, but then I also thought, that is one of the most profound things I've ever heard. <laughs> because we see those moments in Scripture. Abraham, you know, Abraham, get up and leave. Go to the land I'm going to show you. But the point that I'm trying to get to with all this again is we got to have the heart of a child to get into the presence of God or we're going to miss out. So this last part of the passage, Matthew uh, 11, 20, uh, 28 through 30, where Jesus says, Then come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So going back to the question to wrap this all up that I proposed earlier, there was this apparent contradiction where Jesus says, narrow is the way and few find it, but also says, my way is easy. My burden is light. What does he mean by this? And I'm here to propose to you today, Jesus' way is narrow and few find it precisely because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That's why the way is narrow, because his, way, his burden is easy and his yoke is light. So what is Jesus talking about when he's talking about yoke? He isn't talking about the way he likes his eggs cooked, okay? Jesus is, is, is using language that the Jews would have understood they would have understood that Jesus was making a reference to the yoke of the law. And a yoke back then was, was, was basically a beam, sort of, that farmers would put on their oxen, okay, and it would keep the oxen on the path while they were tilling the ground so they wouldn't stray to the right or the left. So the yoke of the law was meant to be a symbol of staying on the path of God's word. And what the, what the, what the religious leaders had done, they had put all these unnecessary burdens on, on the people, but Jesus is saying, you don't have to follow them. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You don't have to, to, to fit in. You don't have to be so concerned about your finances or your popularity or your clout or whatever it is. I am the way of life, and my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And so many times, this is what we want to do. You didn't think I was going to let y'all go without a, one of my silly lessons, did you? Okay. So a lot of times, this is what we do. We're like, yeah, I know. I know Jesus' way. I know my identity should only matter in him and nothing else. But here's what we do. We think, gosh, if I could just get this person or this group to accept me or love me, I'm going to have everything I need. 
Think, man, I, got the, I need to get the house. I got to get my financial plan going, whatever it is. I, this, this is what it's all about. My, my security is in my finances, okay? Or, or we get insecure about our, our appearances, and so we try to control how everybody perceives us on social media or everything that we say to other people. We put those, those burdens in our bag, and we willingly strap it on when what that's going to give us you know we're going through life la di da okay it's going to give us a lot of back pain and maybe surgery down the road but if we're being honest most of us this is what we really want because taking the light burden means Jesus is going to take or pack. And he's going to say, you don't have to be so worried about your finances. You're not in control. A pandemic could come out and wipe it out anyway. I'm the bread of life. You don't have to be so concerned about people looking at you and accepting you when I have chosen you. You don't have to struggle with this sin or this addiction or whatever it is that you've been wrestling with. It's not going to comfort you or give you the longing that only I can satisfy. Because this means we have to open up and show Jesus what's in the bag. When he wants to free us and heal us, so we can just pick up and we're, we can go where he wants us. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. And like Bilbo, we can say, I think I'm quite ready for another adventure. <laughs> if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you'll get that. But most of us, We'd rather have a stupid pile of bricks than the light burden that Jesus has for us because those things we think are going to give us belonging and acceptance or whatever it is we're chasing, that's all it is. It's a brick, and it's going to weigh you down. This message was titled, Learn From Him. Because the last thing I want to point out to you in this passage where he says, Learn from me, because I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Jesus is describing his heart here. The God who has all power, who is over everything. He says, I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Do you see any other God that describes himself that way? And even ourselves, even if somebody doesn't believe in God, we put so many unnecessary pressures and burdens on our life that we were never meant to carry. Yet he is gentle and lowly in heart, will provide rest for our souls. And he specifically says, learn from me. So more than anything else that I want this body to know that I've tried to teach in our leadership classes and our discipleship training is this. You have got to get in the presence of God where it is just you and him alone. And as I close with these final thoughts and the, the band can uh, start coming up. Okay. There is no better person to learn about who Jesus is than from Jesus himself. He says, learn from me. He doesn't say, learn from a book. He doesn't say, learn from a commentary or a theologian or a pastor or a teacher or a Bible study series. He says, learn from me. And I came to this moment where one year I asked God, I said, Lord, let's pretend we have never met before. Let's start from ground zero, just you and me, because I want to see you for who you actually are. Not what my wounds and my past keep saying about who you are, but who you are. So you have got to get with him in prayer. That's why we're going into this prayer emphasis with this Jim Symbola study because it is all about getting to the throne of God. 
to where it's just you and him and nobody else. Something he says in that series is that the central ministry of a church, it's not preaching, it's not children's or youth ministry, it's not worship, it's not programs, it's not events. The central mission of the church is getting people to the throne of grace. It is getting people into the presence of God so that they can have a relationship with God on their own so they can know who they were made to be and who he's called them to be to find their greatest longing in him. Because the whole vision for this discipleship program that we've been teaching our people is, the vision is this. Influencing others to love God with all their heart, mind, and soul. Because that's the end of the day, that's what it's all about. So you may be in here today and you're struggling with that dark night of the soul and asking yourself, why is it so hard? You're carrying bricks. And I challenge you, whatever it is, don't waste another second. Come to the altar. Pray with whoever's sitting next to you. You don't necessarily have to come to the altar, but just find somebody to pray with or just pray on your own and give those burdens to him and ask God to take you on a journey where he teaches you about himself from himself alone and nobody else. Father God, thank you for your children out here. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. God, thank you for the time that I've had here. I pray that you would bless this church in ways that they could have never imagined. Bless Pastor Phil. Bless the elders. Bless Sonia. Bless Eric and Joel and Karen. Bless the kids, Lord. Be with everybody in here, God, who doesn't know you, or Lord, maybe they don't know you as they should. Help us lay our burdens down and come to the throne of grace. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for loving us. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.